I think we did it. Cool. Okay, and uh, I'll admit those guests, and here we go. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Practical Spirituality here in Yerushalayim. I'm Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, and uh, we are going to talk about preparing for, or maybe just talking about what what's the headspace going into Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah's really, really, um, I mean, it's kind of funny for me to call it my favorite holiday, considering my name is Holiday. Uh, my name is Yom Tov, and every holiday is my favorite holiday. But I like Hanukkah particularly because I was born in Greece. And uh, what I mean by born in Greece, I mean Los Angeles. And, um, and part of being born and raised in a place of of what Kabbalistically we'd call great darkness. It makes it kind of exciting, um, particularly exciting to celebrate Hanukkah because it's, um, you know, it's, it's the Greeks were not into our two world situation where we live inside this physical box, inside this illusion, as we would call it. And we really, our deep belief is, and our not just belief, but knowledge, as you'll hear me continue, we actually know that there's a spiritual world that's that's beaming us into existence. And that that spiritual world is the truth. That's the actual true world. That's eternity. It doesn't even have time there. So it's like, this place is clearly with time. This is a place beyond time. And, and, so, and so the Hanukkah is a victory over the the um temporary victory of the greeks over our um philosophy and it was quite a victory they had i mean we were wiped out by these people <laughs> we were so wiped out that our army was was made of the priesthood which is not not good news in general you know you know those aren't the guys who are supposed to be fighting the war you know you're not you don't you don't take your the holiest rabbi from the front of the shul to stick up for you when you're being bullied out outside the synagogue you know, by a bunch of thugs, but uh, but in fact, that's exactly what happened, um, because we had basically succumbed to to our um, our um, enemy, and this was a spiritual enemy. This wasn't like, you know, this wasn't like Hamas or something where it's like clearly a physical enemy, and spiritually, it's just confusing everybody because these people are supposed to be into god but yet they're in like some kind of weird demonistic death cult you know which is just confusing for for a per, for anyone who's a believer in god anyway back to back to us is that we were dealing with we were dealing with a a spiritual um war this was a full spiritual war against these these um these greeks and they greek the greeks were all into form they're all into physical like this world is all you get and we were like uh-uh this world is an illusion this world is a reflection this world is a digital simulation and nothing more than that and even though it's maybe not considered the perfect jew but when you see someone who's very, very observant, what we call a, a chanyuk, uh, or, a, or a, you know, what we call these guys, uh, what they call it in the Gomorrah, it's called a parush kizi. <laughs> the Gomorrah lists several types of people who have already disappeared from this world because all there is is Hashem. Oh, I've got a little basamim. I was picking sage for the seminars. we got to get some of this to in London, actually. <laughs> So even this, like, it's like, isn't it physical? But yet we make this bracha and we, we ascend with it because all there is is Hashem. 
So um, what we call a chanyok in the Gemara is uh, the Gemara lists uh, has a list of of people that are called perushim, people who are like they want nothing to do with this world, ascetics. You know, they're just not part of this world. And um, so one of them is called a, a par, parush kizi, and a parush kizi is from the Lushan uh, hakazos dam. And by the way, I know someone who does a kazos dam here here in Yerushalayim, and I actually went and had a kazos dam, which is bloodletting um historically they used to um pull blood out of your body you know your body replenishes blood so you would pull blood out of your body and i don't know i don't remember exactly what it's good for um but they um it's called bloodletting and so the word parush kizi means he's a he's an ascetic the word ascetic by the way i love teaching english so aesthetic means physical beauty you know like when they design this water bottle in israel like they consider this to be aesthetically pleasing, meaning of beauty. Okay, that's aesthetic. So have them practice your English, aesthetic. And then there's ascetic. Ascetic is a parush. Ascetic is someone who's disconnected himself from the physical world. And the so, so he's called an ascetic kizi, a blood letter. Why? Because he's so busy like with his glasses off so that he shouldn't see something that he doesn't want to see. He winds up bumping into every, everything until he's finally like bleeding, you know, all over. We have a, we have neighbors in the Shtetlach. I live in Botebreid in the middle of Yerushalayim, and we have neighbors in Boteran, which is right up my gate into the next gate. It's where the mikveh is. And, and the, uh, these kids, they've broken arms. They've, 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 their whole face will be smashed sometimes from bumping in walls or falling off staircases or stuff there. So, so like we literally have parish keezies living about 50 feet from our door. And they're, you know, these super sweet, super holy um, people who live next door to us. But we're all supposed to be that way, yet, yet. We're all supposed to be not parushim because as we know, a nazar has to be being a korban chatas for having separated himself from the world, meaning it wasn't enough. God made the 365 forbidden, but you want to make even more stuff forbidden to yourself. So he has to bring a, he has to bring a sin offering to the temple for the sin of separating himself from this world. So it's clear Hashem's, Hashem's will and wisdom is not that we're separate from the world. The opposite, and that's Hanukkah, is to be in, that in the deepest, darkest of the physical, because, and I'll speak about that in a sec, but the deepest, darkest of the physical is where the light is. That's where you light. That's where the light is. So if you're already separate, you know, and in a way you could say that it's really for the goyim to be so separate from this world. That's why you'll notice that most, um, most clergy, which means religious leaders of goyim, are generally purushim. They're celibate, separate from the physical they're not involved in any pragmatia no, no business no nothing there they are separate and that is not what god created the world for god created the world that there should be a dira batach tainim, that god should dwell in the lower worlds that, that is how god wanted this world to be and it's what he wanted us to be doing specifically the jewish people and we're called a mamleches kohanim we are a nation of priests which means every one of us is is the priesthood and every one of us has to bring the light into the darkest place. Well, it turns out that Hanukkah comes every year in the darkest time of the year, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, which is called the winter solstice in English. If one could practice that word too. There's a summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. And it has to take place during that time where we talk about Light, light in the darkest time. I saw someone raise a hand. You want to unmute and ask a question? I saw a hand up. Okay. Anyway, I'm open to questions anytime. And I'm also, because I'm, I'm live streaming on several other platforms, I'll check for questions eventually over there too. Um, so, yeah. So that is the point. We're a nation of priests, and we are here to, to bring the light to the to just the most mundane things. And hence, we'll have laws. And you know, we have um, thousands and thousands of laws, forty-five thousand laws, on how to to 
interact with the material world in such a way that we're raising it. See, if you don't have the laws, so no, no wonder holy people want to separate. But once you have the laws, especially the amazing laws, what are our favorite laws in Judaism? The 365 loisas, is the 355 negative commandments of thou shalt not. Those are our favorite. You know why? Because if you keep those, then you can raise all the stuff that's permitted. Because that 365 lists everything forbidden. And with the all the laws surrounding each one of them, because each one's just really a beam, and uh, and you have to go into its details to understand how to do it. But if you can avoid those 365, that means everything else is let's party and let's raise the light. You know, let's 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 squeeze the light out of that olive. You know, it's a piece of fruit. It's a piece of fruit. We're gonna we're gonna crush it. And we're gonna we gotta crush it. And to get the light. And sometimes Jews are like that. Sometimes you got to crush the Jews to get the light. I mean, I'll tell you in Israel, we're in the best time ever. You know, I mean, now everyone's exhausted. But right after the war started, oh my gosh, the, the, the peace and the community you felt in this land was like, it was like hayinu kechomim. It was, we were like dreamers in the, the unity that was felt here coming off of the last several years of disunity. Um, we are, but when you crush Jews, you get the real, the, you get the juice. <laughs> when you crush, when you crush the Jews, the juice comes out. And when the juice comes out, you get, you get Torah and mitzvahs and masim toivim, and especially avos Yisrael, achdus. And I don't know how long that'll last, because the only reason it would last is because of the ani Hashem in ve'ahavta lo'echa k'moicha, is, you know, <laughs> we're not supposed to love each other because, because Gentiles are trying to kill us. We're supposed to love each other because that's the commandment is to love one another. That's why we're supposed to love each other. And unfortunately, when the war ends, maybe soon, um, when the war ends, you know, sadly, so many of the Jews who are now feeling the love will likely, will likely drift apart again because uh, the point of it the point of it all is the ani Hashem in the so, the living soul of every person that's within us. And that's why we are to unite. Now, let's talk about this light. Someone's making something up here. Or the Jew, or <laughs> someone's making something up. Either God's making us up or we're making God up. One or the other. You can't have both. You can't have both. They can't both be absolute truth. Either God's absolutely true and he's projecting us into creation or this is true, meaning the physical world is the truth and we're projecting that there's a God on the other side of all this. But that wouldn't be true necessarily because, you know, the uh, because it's uh, because who says who says it's a God on the other side of all this? You know, it doesn't mean it's true just because you say it. It doesn't mean it's true if you believe it. So if we're real, if we're really real, so then, so then God is a projection from us. Why? You can't see it. Where is it? Where's God? I don't see God, you know. So it must be we're projecting it. We're, and and if God is real, then we're his projection. Is that clear? I hope that's clear, everybody. Okay, great. So, so who's making who here? Now, the biggest question on atheism, I mean, maybe there's bigger ones, but the, the number one question on atheism is the Big Bang. Big Bang's the number one question in atheism. You can go online and learn all about it. But atheists hate the Big Bang. They're stuck with the Big Bang. There's not much they can do. They even have whole departments in their universities to deal with the Big Bang called theoretical physics, which is a real joke. I think they basically smoke weed all day and stare at their belly buttons, pontificating on what, what the nothing is that made the world. You know, what is that nothing? Because you can't have nothing make a world. You know, but then, but every one of those scientists believes that the world comes from nothing. 
<laughs> which is like the biggest joke in the world and the joke's on them and Judaism always believed the world came from nothing because before there was something there was nothing and that nothing is what we call God which is the and and God created the world out of his consciousness and this whole world's just made of consciousness and consciousness is either in a very far form like min mineral or it's in a closer form like vegetable or it's in, this is not weed, by the way, this is sage, or it's in a, uh, mm, or it's in a, a, um, or it's in an animal form, like my flesh here, which means it's like less hidden, less hidden consciousness, or it's in human form with actual consciousness. Like God took a, like a giant bowl of consciousness, like a huge, vat of consciousness where are my arms huge vat of consciousness and he took his ladle and he just dipped it in and he put it in your head and then 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 he put it in your head and we're all made of the consciousness of a Kurdish Baruch we are literally just hey, where does your consciousness come from and where is it exactly where do you how do you point to it you can't it's part of the infinite whoa so so Interestingly, the second biggest kasha in all atheism is consciousness. And they actually, the atheists really have a trouble with it. It's fun to watch. If you can see some of their videos, they, they start to realize, the honest ones start to realize, oh my gosh, we're using our consciousness to try to figure out where consciousness comes from. Meaning they have to use their consciousness to try to figure out where consciousness comes from. Because consciousness isn't physical. It's not in the body. It's already been proven. This isn't like, it's not like, it's not like science is still looking for consciousness. They, they know it's not in your body. And yet every person's conscious. And I have to use my consciousness to figure out, figure out, you know, where consciousness came from. That's not going to be very helpful. And the, and yet we know before there was something, there was nothing. And nothing you know, had nothing to make the world out of except consciousness. And where we are right now is a projection, a coagulated, congealed consciousness called the physical world, which is made of mineral, vegetable, animal, and human, which is called chai medaber. It's a human animal, meaning it's an animal with a nishmas chai, with consciousness blown up its I wonder if God used a rape pipe for the uh, when he blew consciousness into Adam. Anyway, the um, that's a maybe yovin there. Um, moving on, the the and and so Hanukkah is the victory, and we're going to take those crushed the crushed olive oil, and and we're going to light it in the darkness darkest times in the middle of a, a western greek ace of run world it's so holy right now it's so holy because you know it's it's just the the ultimate contrast of light and darkness we're in we're in the this ultimate contrast between them and and the the physical world which which breeds doubt of of god being the creative source of reality which is the source of light which we'll, i'll talk about in a second but but that is that is the excitement of hanukkah that's the power of the day the power of the of the jewish people ultimately so let's talk about light for a second the the very once God said he's creating the world, meaning once he created that and then created the, the world, he created it out of the story of Genesis and he made the world of light, which is called the Or Ein Sof. The world is actually literally made of light. Now, when you block light, you know, it creates an image. You know, if I block the light from my head, you know, it creates... See if I can turn off that light. So when I block the light from my head, it creates an image. Oh, this is such a high end. This is a very high tech light. If you could see what I got right over my head, so I can't even make a proper shadow. But uh, maybe I can do it on this on this book. Let's see. 
not even it's, it's a very good light I've got so I can't even make a shadow on it yeah kind of anyway if you see that image on the paper that dark image on the paper so that dark image is the absence of light because I'm hiding I'm obscuring the light which creates the image now it could easily be if this were a holographic blocker I mean if this were a holographic plate you would see a three-dimensional image instead of the image on the paper. So I wouldn't even need the paper. You would just see a three-dimensional, you know, you'd see this, this sage three-dimensionally if it were, were there. Now, what is, that, what is that shadow made of? What is that image made of? Well, it's made of the blocking of the light. But what would happen if I turned off the light? It would also disappear. So, so it's a very interesting conundrum. But you realize that that means that the shadow's made of the light. Because if I turn off the light, it's gone. So it must be that the light's the source of the image, even though you're thinking the source of the image is blocking the light. <laughs> it's kind of deep stuff. But the point is, is that God created the world with the orange self, with the light, with his light, his infinite light. And then he blocks that light with what are called the Eulamus, which is these myriads and myriads and myriads of lenses, like in the old slideshows. You know, um, you guys are probably too young to know about this, but there used to be um used to be things called slides, like slide projectors. And maybe in school you had overhead projectors where you had they had these transparencies they would put on the overhead projector and then it would shine onto the screen the image that the teacher wanted to show. So, so imagine you put one overlay and it shows a mountain. Then you put another one in and it's made of trees. So now there's trees on the mountain. Now you have another one that shows a tree much closer with oranges growing on it. And then you have another one with deer on the side. And all of that is blocked light. You understand that's all blocked light. And if it were holographic, you would have it all three-dimensional without a screen. You don't even need a screen. And we, that is the nature of our creation. And what we serve is God. We serve God. God is not that light. God is the emanator. The light is called the emanation, or in Hebrew, it's the world of atzilus. But God is the emanator. He's the ma'atzil. The, he, he's the one emanating that light. And that is all we care about. Now, it turns out that we also care about some other things, but we only care about them because because we either because God told us to or because it's a part of natural morality. There's certain natural morality like like love, care, doing good for somebody is a natural. I call that natural morality. And um, anyway, but the whole point is the service of the light. We're here for the light in the darkness, serving the light. We're in the shadows. This is all a world of shadows. And that, and you can get caught up in the shadows. It's very easy to get caught up in the shadows. You know, uh, you know if you guys ever watched a movie and cried, <laughs> it's a little funny that we're crying considering, you know, this was this movie was written probably by some cocaine addict in Hollywood, California, you know, who's like got more money than he should know what to do with. And, but he made a movie. He's a producer of a movie. And now we're sitting there crying, you know, because we're on a flight. No one was looking, so we decided to watch one of the movies. And and now we're crying because every movie has that scene that makes you cry. And meanwhile, you know, you get a little embarrassed, you know, like, I hope no one's watching me cry here. But you get sucked in. It's hard not to get sucked in to the movie. <laughs> and that's like... You know, it wasn't even based on a true story. This is complete fantasy. And and all you're looking at is a box with light. You know, it's some kind of screen. You're just looking at a projection, and yet you get sucked into it. Well, kol shikane, shiba kol shikane. In our physical world with three-dimensional world and real uh, traffic signs and real gas pedals and real, real... Uh, 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 females to contend with for those whose eyes wander and um and and real you know desires in this world and and all of that stuff and the two biggest ones are 
survival and reproduction. Survival and reproduction. <laughs> Animals are hard hardwired for survival and reproduction, and we call it survival's money. Show us the money. So money, which is physicality, and the other is reproduction, which is sexuality. And those are the two major tests that everyone has to deal with. And that's why you'll notice mounds of commandments around those two. Mounds of commandments around money and, you know, physical, you know, all the bubbles and bubbles of kama, bubbles of bubbles of it's all, it's all like helping you deal with your money and all the, all the divinity mamanas of all those, how you're dealing with physical and it includes all of Shabbos because Shabbos is money's worthless. <laughs> One day a week, you know, you have to like let go of all the money, you know, and and uh, miserus and trumas and miserus and miserus miser sufim and all these tithes that we have to take off of our earnings, um, you know, of our produce and our food and our, it's like how much can you let go? And it's like giant mounds of commandments around that. And mounds of commandments around around sexuality. It was all the Seder Nashim and everything, and all the Surabia, A Meshasra, Bakos, Basha, Bas, 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 Beta, Basmina, Bas, Beta, Akosim, Akosal, Aisha Sahia, Aisha Spen, Aisha Sah, Akos, Ishto, Ime, Male, Akra, Aisha Snida, Goyam, Amani, Adomi, Mitzri, Mumser, Saris, Lissaris. That's right, 37 commandments of Isuribia. And the it's like we got so many forbidden things. Oh, by the way, you can memorize all Tariyag mitzvahs, which is a lot of fun to do. You can do it with your kids. And if you do it with your kids, you read it. You're, you'll probably never memorize it, but your kids will for sure memorize it. And everyone, I, I've taught my kids, and, and uh, they don't even know what they're saying when they're saying, don't worry, the Isuri Bia, the forbidden sexual unions are... Or they don't even know what they're saying when they're saying it. But, you know, you got them in uh, Vodazor, which is 53 commandments. Um, and just one word per commandment, your kids can memorize it. I can send you the sheet with, uh, you just print it up, all the kids get it, and you go through mitzvah by mitzvah every Shabbos meal. And uh, and you do it one line at a time, and that they'll learn all Tariq mitzvahs, bal peh, which is really a pleasure. I have another one with one word per, um, per, uh, there's one word per uh, subject in the whole Chumash. And we go Parsha by Parsha. And I have, my kids have memorized every single Parsha. And so they do so well on their tests because they always know where everything is. And uh, give you an example, like where are we holding Vayeshev now? Are we on Vayeshev? Yeah. Yosef Tama Potifar, uh, Yosef Tama Potifar, Beis Asur, Yosef Tama Potifar Besasura Sarim, meaning Sari Mashko Mashko is in the Sari Oifin. Yeah. Yosef Tama Potifar Besasura Sarim. Yosef Tama Potifar. I keep forgetting Vayeshev. Vayeshev. Yosef Tama Potifar Besasura Sarim. Vayeshev. Yosef Tama. I'm telling you, my kids are way better at that than me at this, but I've got it too after all these years of going over it and over and over and over. And next week will be uh, me case, yeah? Hello, Moshe. Hello, Moshe. Me case, hello, Moshe. Hello, Moshe, Rav. I'm the Tati, but all I have to do is ask my kids, and like even the little kids are like, bam! You know, they know every simon, every subject. Um, not to mention all the Parshas. Ball pen. So listen up. The um, where are we holding? We're talking about. We're good. We're good. I think we're pretty good on this. The uh, I just wanted to show you a really cool thing because it's right. Yeah, Hershey, you have a question? No, I got a little something to show y'all. Yavan, okay, Yavan. So this is the word spiritual spirit, and then the word ritual. Okay, see that? I wrote spirituality, but ignore that. Just spirit and ritual. Spirit, ritual, spiritual. So things that are spirit are not physical, and things that are ritual are physical. You can video a ritual. If someone's doing a ritual, you can certainly video that. 
spirit means something that means lungs full of air is spirit. You're alive, inspired. You see the Swiss Alps, lungs full of air, inspired. You go jogging, you perspire. You over jog, you pass out. Yeah, they come and bring a respirator, respirator. They respire you, bring air back to your lungs. If they if they fail, you expire. Okay, that's the word spirit. It's it's not something physical. It's you can't video spirit. Although you know, you guys all know I'm a pretty spirited guy, um, but you can't. How do you articulate that? You can't point to it. You can't video it. And then ritual that you can video. You know, any ritual. I'm shaking a lulav. I'm lighting the Hanukkah candles. Now, Westerners, B'nai Esav, are very into form. And look at the word Yavan. Yud, Vav, Nun. Yud, ideas, right? Oh, the upper line here is spirit. And the lower line is ritual. The upper line is, is the spiritual world. And the lower line here is the physical world. And you see that they start with the yud. The yud is pure idea. And the Greeks were masters of philosophy, pure idea. They were very good at idea. But they were also very good at implementation. They would bring that idea all the way down to the earth. And this is this is um, a, a vav. What is a vav? A vav is just a yud. But it's brought down to implementation. Like I'm a yud personality, by the way. I've always had a bug working for me to make sure my ideas get to the world. You get that? Like, you, you all know me pretty well to know that nothing would happen <laughs> if I were left to my own devices. I'm dangerous, man. I'll, I'll get nothing done. But I've got my people, and my people always make sure. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't have enough money to hire people. Oh, yeah? The reason you don't have enough money is because you haven't hired anybody. If you'd hired somebody, you know, if you're one of these creative types, and you hire an implementer, you can have a lot of money and you can take a loan, completely unsecured loan. Banks wouldn't even ask you for, they wouldn't even ask you for collateral. Like it's called an unsecured loan. Borrow whatever, borrow $10,000 and pay someone for a few months to implement your ideas. Believe me, you'll have paid him back. You'll pay, you'll pay to him. You'll pay the bank and you're going to be making bank off your ideas. But don't be another foo like Van Gogh, the artist who only sold his first piece of art the last year of his life. Today, his artist, his, even a tiny painting of his is, is in the tens of millions of dollars. But he was one of these Yud creative types. But the, the Yud creative types can also be idiots. You've got to always have a vov in your life. But the problem is, is that if your whole world is just ideas, implementation, Without God, well, then you get to the final nun, which goes into the dark side. It's below the level of physicality. It's the dark side. The, what does it mean, the dark side? The furthest from the light. Remember what we were speaking about before? The whole world's made of light. And, when, and the further you get from that light, hey, what happened to my other light? Let's get my light back before my producer gets me in trouble and starts yelling. Is that better? And before... That light is what creates our world. Now, our world's made of things that are mutter. And the word mutter is, means released. Matir, like matir, so it's released. Meaning you can raise it. Like I got this bottle of water here. And it's, it's released. I, I bought it with money. Didn't steal it. Okay, there's no uh, prohibited tastes inside of it. It's pure water. It is ready to go. Here we go. Lift off SpaceX. And I'm made of 70% water. And I'm adding water to the system of a Jew, which means that before it was just water. Yeah, it was just water. Now it's a Jew. Water has now become Jew. And now the Jew goes and does, does good deeds, commandments, and good deeds, and goes and does good deeds, which means that water is just going up and up and up back to the light. Water's going up. Aliyah, it's called. The term in Kabbalah, in mysticism, is Aliyah for the, all the angels that are 
locked into the darkness because they got sent down into our system via the parallel un parallel worlds to enter into the water. Mm. Mm. It's amazing to drink this way, by the way. You you should, you should. It's worth thinking about these things before you eat a banana or you d eat a delicious sandwich. Tonight we had burritos. We had a we have once a week a family reunion. All my marrieds come home, and we had a big burrito bar for everybody, including craft beer that I flew back from America with. Not that we don't have craft beer here, but I'm a bit of a craft beer snob. So there's some things try them out they're called uh, hazy ipas go for a hazy ipa i think it'll have quite a surprise now that drink that i'm drinking that water is mutter it's released ready to fly back up ready to have aliyah but of the 365 commandments which are the 365 categories of things that are called asur and what's the word asur it means bound up tied down that stuff bound to this world, it's it's the there's no way to release its light. Maybe someday, yes. Maybe in the most Mashiach, we'll be able to receive return its light. But right now it's deep darkness. It is not available. It's not, it's not for return, not at least now. We're not allowed to return it. It and if you get bound up with if you get if you get involved with the forbidden things, you yourself get bound up in it. And now you got that stuff all over you. And you can feel that stuff. Like, for example, if I can touch a guy's hand and I'll just say, you didn't wash Negoblesser. And the guy's like, what? And I said, did you wash Negoblesser or did you not? He's like, I didn't. I'm like, you're busted. Yeah. And I, I've lined up my students at H just to check who's busted and who's not with Negoblesser. Now, of course, it's Bali Chuba and I, no one's getting busted. But it, it was just they love to watch me do it because just to see that you can you can sense when someone's got garbage stuff on them and and it comes from a lack of precision when it comes to the 365 negative commandments of darkness and so we got to be really precise with that and everything that's a ray everything that's mutter is ready to go up now, i'll tell you a funny deal um you don't have to quote me on this, even though I'm doing this live. But um, this is one of my favorite diokim. Because my mother told me when I was a kid, um, she crushed an ant and said, this is what happens when you die, which was not a good lesson to tell a kid. Meaning it was basically the world doesn't, there's no next world. Very Greek thing to say to her son in our mansion in Hollywood, California. And she crushed the ant. This was obviously before the bankruptcy that led to my whole discovery of Judaism. But she crushed the ant. She said, this is what happens when you die. And then she, the next words were a great lesson. She said, but you better, so you better live life to its fullest or live, you better live every day to its fullest. And I have not stopped doing that since, since then. Um, I wish you guys did extreme sports because then I could bring you with me for a whole day. And I'd have to bring you back in a box probably from the exhaustion you would go through. Uh, but I have another such day planned tomorrow, hitting a new trail, which I, as soon as this ends, I'm going to start researching it. Then I'm, then I'm going for a hike with a dear friend into the mountains who's a major creator, uh, amazing stuff, uh, kind of similar to my personality, but more of an introvert. Um, why, what are we talking about? Mutter, releasing, living life to its fullest. That's what we're doing. Living life to its fullest is... Oh, yeah. You ready for my diuk? There's a crazy diuk. The word diuk in Hebrew means an inference. So if the 365 commandments are God's way of telling us, those are the things you shouldn't do. What's the diuk? That anything that's not on that long list are the things you, what? Should do. Go do them. Go see those Alps. Go ride the waves. Experience life. Get out of the ghetto and go crazy in Hashem's world of, of beauty and gratitude and music. I mean, you guys, you don't even know what music is. I, I feel so bad. Like people don't even know. You don't even know what music is. You, you, you were raised without music. Okay. You were raised with 
with a singer who didn't even write his own songs. <laughs> By the way, I'm uh, for those on YouTube Live, I'm looking on Zoom at uh, Hasidic Jews from mostly from New York, but you're raised by people who had a good voice. So they're singing songs that they didn't even write that are not even the writer's words or King David's words. They're, they're like, most of them are just from Psalms or some other place in Jewish liturgy, which means there's like no creativity involved in this, except for the melody written by some guy who gets melodies, but you know, doesn't want to like lose Shaduchim. So he has some other Waldo sing his songs. So it's like, you know, it's just nuts, nuts. And they, no wonder Bali Chua, like, like our kids are crazy about the same music you guys have raised him. But we're, my wife and her are like, close the door, put on the Bluetooth speaker and let's crank some tunes. But I'll just give you an example, like uh, the Dixie Dregs, for example. Um, it won't be with lyrics, but hey, Siri, play the Dixie Dregs. Playing. So I'll give you a little example. You're not going to get any real bass in this, but. Just choosing the right song. You guys hear it? Can't hear it? Oh, I think my settings aren't on for music. Can't hear it? No way, huh? That's so interesting. Anyway, check out the Dixie Dragons. You guys will enjoy them. And they're part of like a, I mean, just more hours of listening than you could ever have the rest of your life without any lyrics whatsoever. Uh, meaning you don't have to hear any garbage from some, you know, drug addict rock star, you know, and who probably does write his own, but whatever. And it may be beautiful and may be very creative, but you don't need that in your head. So there's just a ton of this stuff. I, you know, I need my son to show me how to do the music settings for the microphone. Oh, here. Let's see if I can get that real quick. Yeah. Never mind. Anyway, um, but you heard the you heard the diak. Yes, you like my diak. <laughs> Go do it. Go do that stuff. And there's even been great rabbis who said that you would have to answer for it if you didn't. You have to answer for it if you didn't enjoy God's will. Did I turn it? Oh, I turned it too low. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Um, anyway, so what I wanted to show you, I'll just finish with this, is if you look at the word Greece, yeah, if you look at the word Greece, you'll see that the uh, that it's spelled Yavan, but it goes all the way to the dark side, because if you don't have God, if you don't have God, so then it just goes into the dark side. So it's like, hey, let's let's split an atom and create energy. Okay, that's a nice idea. Hey, we did it. Nuclear power. And then without God, it's like, hey, let's attach it to a warhead and destroy whole cities and turn the whole world into a microwave oven, you know, which is the final nun. Comes the tzaddik, tzion, which is a nun, but his legs have been brought up from below the baseline with a yud here. Comes the tzaddik. I gave him a little face here because his, his hands are in shemayim but he's like way on the baseline. He's firmly in the physical. Yeah. And his, his hands are up to Shemaya. And if you look at the word Sion, Sadik Yud Vav Nun, which is Gematria Yosef, is the, um, is the word Yavan, only in the, the, the idea and the form and the dangers of the Tariq the 365 negative commandments are all being informed by the tzaddik, by the, the holy man, by the Torah, by the righteousness, by the by the by good, by Shemayim, by above, the light, serving the light. And that's ultimately what Eretz Yisrael is about. Sion, 
represents Yerushalayim and the base of Mikdash and the you know the fire, the fire of the light of Hanukkah, but coming off the menorah and the Mizbeach in Harabayas. And and it, it's it's very interesting and um that Joseph, Yosef was who is the same numerical value of this, which is I think it's 256. Let's see, Sadiq is 90, it's 100, 106, 156. Yeah, 156 is uh, the numerical value of Joseph. Yosef is 156. And, and he, if you didn't know Torah Shabal Pei, you'd see that Yosef was, hey, very well. They, if you didn't know Torah Shabal Pei, you'd see that Yosef is the, the, He's not, you wouldn't know he's a holy man. We call him Yosef Hatzadik, like the lettered Sadik. He's called Yosef Hatzadik. And his whole thing was creating the infrastructure of the of the Jewish, sorry, the infrastructure of the, um, what was, what would become the redemption from Egypt. He was just a, tre he was like the treasurer of the United States, for example. He was the treasurer of the most powerful country in the world, pure money, pure physical, pure. And we know he was like the Salsos Payas. He was like, he was like into the physical. Yeah, and you'll see it even says like, he is already off up to no good, this guy. Because it, it, it says Roy Itzain. It says at the very beginning of the parish, it's Roy Itzain is Chaser. It says Yosef Ra, <laughs> Yosef the evil. You know, is he a or is he evil? Because it, it's it's spelled without the vav, so it just says Yosef Ra. And then later his brothers bring the Dibar Ra, you know, with Resh Ayin He to their father. Same same exact word, Roe and Ra. And and the uh, anyway, but Yosef creates the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure for redemption. So I wonder sometimes because the the maskilim, the enlightened ones who are the in darkened ones, which is so funny that it's called enlightenment, but the maskilim that that founded the state of Israel with their Zionist movement, they they are totally secular, like completely trying to remove themselves from anything resembling the spirituality of the Jewish people and Jewish life. That's who founded this place, and. And they are, meaning Israel, modern Israel. So I wonder sometimes if there's a connection of, because they were called the Zionim, the, the Zion, Zionist movement. And it's just very interesting because they're called the Zionists. And Yosef was this treasure, just physical, material, you know, gatherer of the wealth during the, fam the seven years of famine. And... But we who know the written, the oral Torah know that he was this holy man with his hands in heaven and his feet on the ground. And he was he was the 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 he even made it into the list of shepherds of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Yosef, and David. He he made it in. So he's like super, super like high, like beyond the other brothers of the 12 tribes. He is he's one of the shepherds. But it, if you look at the actual Torah, he's like, okay, he's good at dreams, man. <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a hell of a treasurer. But I don't see the holy part here. And, um, you know, the opposite, you see him, like, fall deeply into a major test with uh, with the wife of the, um, of, uh, you know, the head of that household and, and finally waited till there was no one around that he could go lie with her. When uh, he finally like has this right before he does the deed, he's not even wearing his clothes right before he does the deed with with, you know, this Egyptian man's wife. He he gets a vision of his father and his father says, you know, there's going to be a uh, the going guttle. The, the high priest is going to have a breastplate with these beautiful crystals on it with the name of each tribe on it. And you are about to have your name removed from that breastplate if you keep going with this one. And and what's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, when it says when it's sadly says something, even conditionally, it still comes true. Yosef's not on the breastplate. His sons are. You ever thought about that? 
from that midrash. Like, no, I don't, no one ever thinks about that. <laughs> like, yeah, Yosef's like, yeah, I'm out of here. And then he runs out of there. And I'm not going to tell the next part, but he runs out of uh, Aisha's Potiphar's house and um, digs his 10 fingers into the ground. Well, I'll say it. He digs his 10 fingers out of into the ground and, and a tipa of seed comes out of each finger into the earth. And I'm not going to tell you the rest of where that goes in Kabbalah. But but it's interesting that he actually doesn't wind up with his name on the breastplate because he has Ephraim and Menashe in the breastplate of the high priest. Bottom line is that Yosef, these, the Parsha of Yosef always comes for Hanukkah. It always comes for Hanukkah. And he is Tzion. And he is the example of the physical and the spiritual coexisting or the raising of the spiritual from the physical. And I think sometimes in Israel, because I'm living here for over 33 years, and I have, I'm have, i a very, very not political person, like very, you know, I, I like basically rejected America as a kid. And, I, and believe me, by the time I got here with a hundred of these babies coming down my back, I wasn't looking to be part of the state of Israel in any way, shape, or form. And that's only gotten stronger the more I've studied about it, the more I've studied Torah, especially in Chazal. But the, the, um, so I've wondered sometimes that while the secular Israelis are having a negative birth rate, I don't know if you know, but they have an extreme negative birth rate. They're like the, they're like the people in Scandinavia for lack of children. And they won't even print the numbers. It's so bad. They only will print the numbers of those who marry. They're not printing the numbers of all the Israelis who never get married, not printing the LGBT Tel Aviv community's numbers of how many children they're having. You know, it's a total joke. While meanwhile, this massive amount of children are being born by this extremely powerful community of Jews who keep Torah in the land of Israel. I mean, we're talking massive amount of children being born. And so it's almost it's very clear to me that in the end, the um, the observant Jews are who are living tzaddik and totally repudiating any of these ideas and implementation and that stuff. Meaning they're just not part of that world; they're just in the Torah world, and but they're the ones having all the kids. So it seems that Zion's coming our way, coming soon to a theater near you, Zion. Shalom, everybody. It was a pleasure to teach you all tonight. And please, God, we'll do much more as the days move on. Shalom. Slachot.